We were in a tunnel, somewhere near Pont de Champaret on the boulevard périphérique, otherwise known as the Perif. We are going anti-clockwise around the circle on the périphérique extérieure. We are on an unusual road, a voie communale, but one with a statue autoroutier. In other words, neither the rules for normal city streets nor motorways apply. So let's go a little faster. Particularly as we haven't yet spotted the next one of the 16 speed cameras spread around this loop. 16 cameras that make it, according to Le Figaro, l'axe routier le plus contrôlé de France. Cameras to enforce a speed limit of 70 kilometers an hour. Cameras that managed to catch 461,596 speeding motorists in 2014, the year they dropped the speed limit by 10 kilometers an hour. 16 cameras that mean we will never break the record currently held by a Swede named Ghost Rider, who in 2003 gets on his motorbike and at an average speed of 221 kilometers an hour covers the 35 kilometers of Perif in 9 minutes and 57 seconds. A time that beats the 11 minutes and 4 seconds taken by Prince Noir in 1988, but which will never replace the Black Prince's legend because Prince Noir is the King Arthur of Parisian bikers, a folkloric figure, a myth spoken of in hushed tones in forums across the internet. Is he real, they ask? Is he dead? He is real, replied the voices. He lives still, and he is a hero still, even though his real name is Pascal. In a while, we'll get to the original bit of the Perif, the first stretch, opened in April 1960, but imagined in reveries and nightmares long before. You can tell the early part, because the concrete on the supporting walls is made to look like stone. For the first section, they made an effort. Later on, they wouldn't bother. But the first section is cramped, as you imagine the 1950s were. There are fewer lanes, down to two for one section, near the exit to the A6 in Orly. Obviously one of the busiest, obviously one of the most blocked. So before we hit traffic, let's drive back in time like a DeLorean full of academic Marty McFlies and see how we got here. What is effectively the seventh historical wall around Paris begins with the sixth. It is 1841 and Adolphe Thiers has built his fortifications, his wall, moat and gates, the same fortifications that the same Thiers will order his Versailles forces to breach 30 years later so they can get into the city to massacre the communards. On the not Paris side of these fortifications there is a 200 metre wide strip of land. On April the 3rd, 1841, this land is declared a zone non edificandi. In other words, no one can build on it. Still. Houseman, as so often, has some ideas. After annexing into Paris the parts of surrounding towns that Thiers had kindly placed inside his wall, the Baron thinks about creating a ceinture verte around his newly circular city, a Parisian green belt filled with lovely new parks and trees. But as with so much in life, there is a lot of talk, but very little action. Nothing really happens until April 1919, April being the favourite month in Perif history, when everyone agrees to tear down the Thiers wall and the city manages to get the land back from the state so it can build new housing, including the red brick HPM. Except the zone non edificandi, which remains non constructible, this time because of questions of hygiene and salubrité, as one historian puts it. But, as you can't keep a good void down, that empty space begins to fill with shanty towns spilling over from the banlieue, shanty towns inhabited by the poor and the colonized, shanty towns of caravans and wooden huts lining dirt streets, home to rag pickers and labourers, servants and maids, and, if you listen to the press, thieves and criminals, murderers and robbers, shanty towns the hygienists and property developers dream of destroying, shanty towns everyone calls la zone. It doesn't take long after the Germans' arrival for the voices to rise against La Zone. The old Maréchal, for example, describes it thus. This enceinte of misery and ugliness that grieves both the heart and the head. The voices tout their facts of proof. In La Zone there are seven off-licenses for every one boulangerie, they say. If you listen, you can still hear their tutting. No, they all say, La Zone needs to be cleared. And so it's now, in July 1943, in the heart of the occupation, the, the official documents begin talking about doing just that, by building a boulevard périphérique. 
the Inspector General, Chef du Service de Topographie et d'Urbanisme writes, It is important to ensure at all costs that Paris does not flow into a banlieue that will bog it down again for a century. Paris, Grand Salon of Europe, demands care, sacrifices and particular consideration, and it must be defined in an elegant and precise fashion, so that étranger, upon stepping foot in the Ile de France, can say, Voici Paris, without confusing it with Le Valois, Aubervilliers, Pontin, Vitry or Malakoff. This will be the role given to the boulevard périphérique, to set, with its beautiful lines of poplars, elms and plane trees, the territory of Paris. Because even though they have got rid of the Thiers wall, and even though they really do want the land to build more housing and sports infrastructure, like good Nazi sympathisers they are obsessed with physical fitness, the wartime authorities still yearn for a barrier, they still want above all to keep Paris separate. As if Paris needs protecting again, needs cordoning off, not from the occupying forces who, after all, simply Lily Marlene their way in three years ago, but rather, and here a theme is set that still plays out to this day, from the enemy within, or rather just without. They are haunted by the rag pickers and labourers and their shacks sitting just on the edge of the city. Paris needs a cordon sanitaire to give it protection from the infection that is the banlieue, a Maginot line against its surrounding towns, a prophylactic to prevent any accidental flow and so any chance of métissage. But let's keep moving forward through the past. To 1954, when the first section of the new road that will be built right on top of the zone is approved. Then 1956, when the state and the Conseil Général decide that the new ring road will be part of the national motorway system. Let's watch as those beautiful lines of imagined trees, those poplars and elms, disappear under the optimistic concrete of post-war modernity. The new boulevard périphérique ceases to be a parkway and becomes a highway. Paris will have its ring, its territorial marker, but the green belt will be grey. They start building. They finish over 17 years later and have built 35.04 kilometres of road when measured at the central reservation, 9 kilometres of embankments, 6.5 kilometres of viaducts, 6 kilometres of cut and cover tunnels, 82 engineered structures including 9 crossings of railway lines, 2 canal crossings, 2 Seine crossings and 9 interchange junctions. Oh, and at the Porte de Bagnolet they have expropriated 2,000 families and 70 businesses to build one échangeur. The périph is finished, and finally a circle. It is officially opened on April the 25th, 1973, by Prime Minister Pierre Mesme. Paris has its loop. Paris is encircled. Paris is saved from infection. On the opening day, Jean Pézieux, a reporter from France Inter, and his driver Jean Daniel do the loop in one hour and six minutes, which means that Jean Daniel drives at an average speed of 31.81 kilometers an hour nearly 50 kilometers an hour less than the then speed limit on the day it opened, on a Wednesday afternoon. Which makes you think that the next interviewee, a delightfully grumpy Parisian, is probably right when he says, Je ne crois pas que ça roule aussi bien. So here we are, still on our Sunday morning jaunt, still moving. Please note those signs, all brightly lit up with the magic words every Francilien in a car wants to see, Perifluide. But then it's still only 8.30 on a Sunday morning in February, not a Friday evening when you might as well get out and walk to your destination, and you've been tempted. Because people have been fretting over the périph and its capacity since the moment it was planned, and the day it opens that journalist on France Inter finishes his report by saying that in a few years the new road will be saturé. The périph's destiny was always to be never quite enough, except perhaps visually. Ugly roads, write the authors of The View from the Road, a 1964 classic about highway design, are often taken to be one price of civilization, like sewers or police. Which, if true, surely makes the perif proof that 1973 marks the high point of human civilization. For the perif is, and there really is no other word for it, ugly. And not just for the hundred thousand people who live by it. Even as a driver, its great engineering feats, like the bridge across the river at Bercy, built using innovative preformed struts, or the impressive Pont de Massina over the Austerlitz rail yards, Paris's longest bridge, are lost in the stressful circularity. 
when the view from the road authors write, an equidistant ring would be monotonous, an experience of unvarying impact and lacking in a sense of arrival. They could have been describing the perif rather than a proposed road around Boston. But the ugliest thing about the perif is not the greyness, the dirtiness, the pollution, the traffic jams, the noise, the below ground level cuttings that reduce the view to dull meaninglessness as the view from the road has footed. Nor is it the fact that the road is hidden out of sight when it goes through the smarter western arrondissement, but placed on elevated sections in the Polo East. Compare any bit in the 16th with, say, the stretch by Porte de Pontin. No, the worst thing, the ugliest thing about the Perif is that it is exactly what that collaborationist functionnaire yearned for. A more effective barrier around the city than any of the previous six enceintes. In their book, Des Fortifs au Perif, Jean-Louis Cohen and André Lorty write, In the capital's past, the portes were always once absorbed into the fabric of the city and transmuted into place, focal points of life and urbanity. Visit any of the portes today, and while you will see people, you will find dead spaces, non-spaces, to quote Marc Auger. Spaces that, despite being transport interchanges for trams, buses, metros, cars, exist separately from the rest of the city. They have not been transmuted into place, they have been quarantined into voids. Take a visit to Porte d'Aubervilliers and take in the particulates and cacophony while picnicking in the green space in the middle of the roundabout. Or head over to Porte des Lilas, where the Perif has been covered with a lovely new park, but still makes its presence felt, as, to reach the Parc Serge Gainsbourg, you have to cross the flow of cars coming up from the road below, marooning the park from Paris. And let's not even get started on any of the big spaghetti junctions linking the Perif to motorways, like Porte de Bagnolet or Porte de Bercy. The Perif condemns its port to isolation as much as it isolates the city sitting behind it. Oh, you might say that Paris's glorious singularity is also about changes in administrative boundaries and status, Paris becoming a département in its own right in 1968, Paris getting its own mayor four years after the Perif opened. But look at the desire across time for Paris to be separate, for Paris to remain central, dazzlingly different from its surrounding area. Walk alongside the Perif, under the Perif, where, by the way, there always seems to be a man with his hands suspiciously near the front of his trousers. Drive around its circle, get stuck in its traffic jams, and it feels clear that if Paris and Parisians feel separate from the rest of France, and the rest of France feels the same about Parisians, the Perif is part of the reason. And not just because it holds everything inside it physically, it does it psychologically too. If the first thing you see when you look out on the rest of the country is the perif, it's perhaps not a surprise that you ignore your neighbours and look inwards, perhaps why it feels as if all the buildings near the perif inside Paris have their backs turned to the rest of France, the better to avoid the smell and noise that Chirac should really have been worried about. So let's stop driving round and round. Let's stop going forward in a circle. Let's park the car, because if you want a pantomime villain in the story of the Perif, we're in it. To the view from the road again. The modern car interposes a filter between the driver and the world he is moving through. Sounds, smells, sensations of touch and weather are diluted in comparison with what this pedestrian experiences. Vision, they continue, is framed and limited. Looking at the Perif and its consequences, you can only agree.